Back in the days when multi-mode was the only fiber commercially available, development efforts continued on single-mode technology, which resulted in its commercial introduction in 1983. Since then, single-mode has displaced multi-mode for most long-distance applications greater than 2 kilometers and comprises about 90% of all optical fiber manufactured today. Single-mode became the preferred fiber for long-distance, inter-office trunk and loop feeder applications, including fiber to the home, while multi-mode fiber, with its lower cost sources and detectors, would continue to serve the needs of local area networks, security, and industrial control applications. Because single-mode fiber does not need to address the propagation times of different modes, the simplest of them have a step index construction. However, single-mode fibers with improved bending resistance or optimized for use in different wavelength bands have more complicated refractive index profiles. Unlike multi-mode fibers, where optical power distribution is entirely within the core, light transmission within step index single-mode fibers assumes a Gaussian distribution. This distribution becomes non-Gaussian for the more complicated profiles. Depending on the wavelength of operation, approximately 80% of the light travels within the core, while 20% travels in the surrounding cladding. The diameter of the light spot is called the mode field diameter. The mode field diameter for standard single-mode fibers is specified by the International Telecommunications Union, or ITU, and other standards bodies. Recommendation G.652 can have mode field diameters at a 1310 nanometer operating wavelength ranging from 8.6 to 9.5 microns with a plus or minus 0.7 micron tolerance. The larger the mode field diameter, the easier it becomes to splice and terminate, but the more sensitive the fiber is to bending losses. Optical fibers are available with a number of core sizes, designed for various applications. Single-mode fibers are made with core sizes ranging from about 8 to 12 microns and a cladding size of 125 microns. The standard single-mode fiber commonly in use today was developed in 1983 for use at 1310 nanometers and subsequently improved for use at both 1310 and 1550 nanometers. It has a typical loss of 0.35 dB per kilometer at 1310 nanometers and 0.25 dB per kilometer at 1550 nanometers. The fiber exhibits zero dispersion near 1310 nanometers. Single-mode fibers will propagate a single mode only when the wavelength of the light source is longer than a certain value. As wavelength gets shorter, the core has more room for higher order modes to propagate. The cutoff wavelength is the minimum wavelength at which an optical fiber will support only one mode. The use of sources shorter than the cutoff wavelength turns a single mode fiber into a multi-mode fiber, where modal dispersion again becomes a problem. Thus, it is important to match single mode fiber with the proper wavelength light sources to establish true single-mode operation. Single-mode fiber bandwidth is limited by other phenomena, which have become more recognized over time with increasing transmission speeds. Chromatic dispersion occurs in both multi-mode and single-mode fibers because different wavelengths have different propagation times through the fiber. As a pulse travels along a fiber, some wavelengths arrive at the receiver later than other wavelengths, effectively increasing the pulse width. If the shorter wavelengths arrive first, this is called positive chromatic dispersion. When data speeds become high enough or the fiber is long enough, the pulses begin to overlap, resulting in errors. The effects of chromatic dispersion can be reduced by using laser light sources. Several types of lasers are used, including fabry perot distributed feedback, electroabsorption modulated, and the lower cost vertical cavity surface emitting lasers, or VIXELs. Lasers emit light that is almost a single wavelength compared to an LED source. Referred to as spectral width or line width, the range of wavelengths produced by a light source is a measure of its spectral purity. When unmodulated, a perfect light source would have a true single wavelength, and one would think that chromatic dispersion would not be a problem. However, modulating any light source results in spectral broadening, which produces a small but discernible range of wavelengths that propagate in the fiber, allowing dispersion effects to become a limitation. There are two types of chromatic dispersion, material dispersion and waveguide dispersion. 
Material dispersion occurs because the speed of light varies at different wavelengths in any given optical material. Material dispersion is dominant in multimode fiber and standard single-mode fiber. It is highly sensitive to the line width of the optical source. The second type is caused by the nature of the fiber waveguide itself and is known as waveguide dispersion. Waveguide dispersion occurs because optical energy travels in both the core and cladding of a fiber at slightly different speeds. This is due to the difference in refractive indices between the core and the cladding. Practical single-mode fibers are designed so that material dispersion and waveguide dispersion cancel one another at the wavelength of interest. With the increasing trend to higher bit rates, another form of dispersion began to emerge called polarization mode dispersion or PMD. PMD has the potential to become a network killer in systems operating beyond 10 gigabits per second. Thus, the understanding and mitigation of PMD is extremely important to anyone who works with high bit rate fiber systems. Like all electromagnetic radiation, light waves have an electrical component and a magnetic component that oscillate perpendicular to one another and to the direction the light wave is traveling. The polarization direction is defined as the alignment of the electrical field. The light wave in this example has its electrical field in the vertical direction and is said to be vertically polarized. If the electric field is horizontal, the light is horizontally polarized. And if the field direction rotates as the wave travels, the light is said to be elliptically or circularly polarized. Unpolarized light consists of a random jumble of all states of polarization. Some sources emit polarized light and some do not. Regardless of the source, most single-mode fibers support only two perpendicular modes of polarization of the transmitted signal, often called the fast axis and the slow axis. In a perfectly symmetrical fiber, the two polarization modes would travel at the same speed, behave as a single mode, and there would be no problem. However, fibers are not perfect, and slight differences in symmetry along the fiber span causes one of the modes to propagate slower than the other, resulting in pulse spreading. In addition, when a fiber is squeezed, bent, or stressed, the glass temporarily exhibits two refractive indices, a property called birefringence. This greatly increases PMD effects. PMD can be hard to mitigate because the effect is random and can fluctuate with environmental conditions. Two common examples include thermal stresses and the random vibration present near railroad tracks. PMD has not been a significant effect in shorter spans at bit rates up to 10 gigabits per second deployed at the moment, but with the tight 25 picosecond bit period of 40 gigabit systems, it is expected to become an issue in the near future. To ensure that existing fiber spans can handle 40 gigabit traffic, it is necessary to perform PMD tests. A number of manufacturers offer test equipment for this purpose. Here, we see an older single-mode span installed in the early 1990s being tested to confirm specific values at 40 gigabits per second.
As more fiber to the user networks are being deployed, questions arise as to the best way to connect the large number of subscriber drop cables to the network. Drop cables connect each optical network terminal, or ONT, at the subscriber premises to a splice closure or fiber access terminal, where they are then connected to a main fiber distribution cable. With aerial installations, the splice closure is typically mounted on a strand or pole. Aerial installations are often desirable because installation costs are lower and there is no need to dig in residential properties. They can also provide easy access for ads, moves and changes. In addition, many drop cables feature a figure eight design having a built-in metal messenger for aerial attachments. Telcordia requirements state that splice closures must be designed for simple aerial attachment. In underground installations, the two common methods for creating access points on distribution cables are pedestals and handholes. Pedestals have the advantage of easy access, but that access is often a disadvantage as well. Untrained technicians can also gain access, as can any curious person who may wish to break into or vandalize the equipment. Pedestals are subject to impact damage from vehicles, and some neighborhoods, for aesthetic reasons, may frown on having a pedestal every two to four houses. For this reason, it may be better to deploy closures below ground in handholes. Inside the handhole, a splice closure provides environmental protection. Closures designed for fiber to the user applications have a number of key distinctions from other outside plant closures. First, they are often smaller to allow a better fit in the cramped space of the handhole. They also have smaller cable ports to accommodate the smaller diameter drop cables, which typically contain less than six fibers. This type of closure may be accessed often as subscribers sign up for service, so the closure must be designed for quick re-entry and multiple cable terminations. The methodology for deploying drop cables to individual subscribers must also be taken into consideration. Because they are single mode, drop cables can be either pre-terminated with connectors or spliced in the field. Most FTTX connectors are either SC or LC types and can be UPC or APC polished depending on the reflection specifications. Typically, the APC polish is required for analog video systems. There are three options for FTTX drop cable terminations. The traditional method is to install the cable and splice a pigtail at the ONT side of the drop cable. This method allows for easy slack management, but requires a higher skill level and equipment cost for the installer. The second method is to install a pre-terminated drop cable using hardened connectors. These connectors tend to be inflexible and present more slack management problems. The third option is a mixture of the first two. By installing drop cables that are pre-terminated on one end and back pulling the drop cable to the FDH, the installer can trim the slack as needed. All the splicing now would be performed at one location, creating a cost-effective solution while resolving the slack problem. Splicing the drops can reduce material costs of connectors and provide a more reliable all-fused network. Handheld portable fusion splicers have been developed specifically for splicing pigtails at the ONT. Some closures designed for use in FTTX networks contain internal brackets to accommodate connector six-packs. Pigtails can then be sliced to the incoming drop and distribution cables, simplifying the process of ads, moves, and changes. Some of the newest types of FTTX closure feature weatherproofed hardened connectors on the outside of the closure. When not in use, these connectors are sealed with plugs containing O-rings for a reliable airtight seal. Pre-terminated drop cables are available in different standard lengths and their connectors also feature sealing caps. The installer simply uncaps an available port on the closure and screws in the drop cable plug. The protective plug and cap are then connected together to keep them clean and dry. Connectorized closures makes ads and changes fast and simple, but one drawback is cable slack. Because drop cables must be supplied in specific length increments, there will be uneven amounts of slack for each drop cable that must be stored, either at the premises or with the closure. In cramped handhold installations, this may be difficult and messy. Hardened pre-terminated drop cables are much more rigid than conventional types, allowing them to be pulled through ducts without damage. Their inflexibility can cause problems in cramped spaces. As an alternative, 
A compact transition box can be placed at the premises near the ONT for slack storage. As a communications cable moves into the local loop, it is necessary to access the digital carrying members of that cable to provide drops to local subscribers. Fiber optic pedestals, which can also be called fiber access terminals, provide a low cost and convenient method of providing this access. They can also provide a transition between the FDH and the ONT. Drive through any neighborhood or along a rural road and you'll see pedestals everywhere. Historically, pedestals have been most widely used by telephone companies for copper cables, but recently the trend towards fiber to the user has driven the evolution of the pedestal to accommodate optical cables as well. The first pedestals used for fiber optic applications were simply re-engineered versions of existing copper pedestals. This model features an open architecture for easy cable and buffer routing, but has limited protection against dust, insects and rodents as it has only a single protector dome. Pedestals usually have separate areas for the storage of the buffer slack that is to be expressed through the pedestal as well as for the buffers that must be accessed for drops. In this model, the express slack is routed around the inner frame of the pedestal while the buffers to be spliced are routed into a storage basket positioned behind the splice tray. This pedestal can accommodate up to 96 fibers with 4 meters or 12 feet of buffer slack. As with all cable management products, fiber slack allows for access to splicing stations and to handle future ads, moves and changes. This pedestal is an example of a product that has been designed specifically for fiber optic applications. One notable difference from the previous model is the inner plastic dome that provides better protection against moisture, dust, insects and rodents. This pedestal has been designed to meet the Telcordia GR771 requirements for resistance to wind-blown sand, dust, water and vibration. The inner frame of the pedestal features slack storage for the express buffer tubes and a storage basket for buffer tubes that must be accessed and spliced. The lower section of the frame provides weather-tight sealing and strain relief for inbound and outbound cables. The cables are first prepared by stripping an amount of jacket and buffer materials as required by the user or company practice. The recommended strip length for this pedestal is 4 meters or 12 feet. If the cable contains a dielectric central strength member, it can be trimmed and secured to the pedestal frame using the strength member clamp. Isolation of a metallic strength member requires the use of a bonding clamp. Sealing of the cables is provided by custom-designed rubber grommets that are press-fit into a number of slots positioned around the base of the pedestal frame. The slots to the rear of the frame are used for feed and branch cables, while the slots in the front are used for drop cables. In ring cut applications, the feed cable grommets can be cut and then fitted around the cable jacket before the assembly is placed into the appropriate slot. A hose clamp is passed through the T-slot and around the cable jacket. When hose clamps are used in fiber optic applications, it is extremely important to not over tighten them. This could cause crushing of the cable's buffer tubes and fiber damage. On high count cables where it is difficult to attach a strength member clamp, the hose clamp will usually suffice for securing the cable to the pedestal back plate. Keeping moisture, dust, insects and rodents out of a pedestal is of paramount importance for long-term reliable operation. As part of the pedestal installation practice, a plastic vapor barrier must be placed on top of the backfilled soil to keep out moisture. Pea gravel is then placed on top of the barrier to a point approximately one inch below the top of the drop channel. This square base of this pedestal allows for firm placement in the outside plant environment. 
If additional stability is required, a metal or wooden stake can be attached to the rear or sides of the pedestal base. During cable or pedestal restoration or repair activities, the split base feature allows for easy placement around an existing cable. The base can then be bolted to the stake and backfilled with soil both inside and out up to the ground level mark. This base also features a removable plastic drop channel. When the pedestal is placed and backfilled, the drop channel prevents the fill from obstructing the cable port, allowing the cable to pass easily into the pedestal. Most pedestal damage is caused by vehicle strikes and brush fires. To limit the possibility of vehicle strikes, the location of the pedestal must be chosen to be as far as possible out of the path of oncoming vehicles. Additional protection can also be provided by mounting the pedestal on a concrete base or by placing it behind an appropriate barrier. Fire protection is offered in this pedestal by the use of plastic domes. In a brush fire, the plastic will melt down slightly, allowing the heat to vent up from the top, keeping the fibers as cool as possible. A metal dome will act like an oven in a fire, concentrating the heat and cooking the fibers. The airtight dome also protects the splices in the event the pedestal is completely submerged in water. Due to the bell jar effect, air pressure prevents water from rising higher than 6 inches above the highest opening in the outer dome. Pedestals will continue to evolve to meet the needs of designers, installers and users.